Eagle Creek. And though it's frozen right now, it flows through Waterloo and joins up with other creeks and tributaries to become part of the Grand River watershed system. Hi, I'm Tannis McDonald. And on this episode of Watershed Riders, I sat down with poets Yvonne Blomer, Laurie D. Graham, and Gary Barwin to talk about writing the watershed in a collection called Sweet Water, Poems for the Watershed. Coming up next, our conversation. I'd like to welcome all three of you to Watershed Writers. So welcome Yvonne Blomer, Gary Barwin, and Laurie D. Graham, our poets who are going to be talking about uh, watershed systems, uh, about water systems in general. And I wanna have a start with kind of robust four-way conversation about um, water as space and consciousness and what poetry has to do in service to all of that. So, uh, First of all, I'll finish my welcome. Welcome all. Thank you, Tannis. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I want to start with this idea of personal relationships to uh, water systems before we start talking about um, Sweet Water, Poems for the Watershed, the um, collection that Caitlin Press published and that Yvonne edited and the three of us have work in. Um, when I think about like a personal relationship to water systems, I, I often think about growing up in Winnipeg at the junction of the Red and the Assiniboine Rivers. And certainly there's a, you know, a long indigenous history of that, the junction of those two rivers being um, a, a place of trade and uh, which was also true when settlers uh, came to that land. And um, it, in many ways, it formed the character of the city. And when I was a kid, we always went and hung out by the river. And the river was a place of pleasure. And it also was a place of danger. Many people per year drown in that river. So um, water systems as a kind of route to uh, where we live, to our locality, um, is something that I, I feel like I've been thinking about for a long time. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to hear from some of you about water systems when you first became aware of them, um, but you know, water's life, but water's history too. So what do you think? What's your history with water systems? Uh, I, I grew up close to the North Saskatchewan River, um, a river that runs from the Rocky Mountains into Hudson's Bay. Uh, so I kind of came into consciousness with that river as as a guide and I re recall understanding at a pretty young age perhaps especially on the prairies because this is in Edmonton uh, that people organize themselves according to where the water is that was something that I kind of got from from very early on this is coming into conception about humans organizing themselves and things so that formed my consciousness in a significant way. Gary, Vaughn, what about you two? Um, I grew up partly in Shored Park outside of Edmonton, which I think Lori did too. <laughs> and um, so I'm thinking about lakes, like lakes close to Shored Park. And my family had friends with a cabin on Skeleton Lake. So a lot of summers spent swimming and sailing on that lake. Um, and now I live on an island in the Pacific. So the body of water that I most often am thinking about, I guess, is this big Pacific Ocean that, you know, controls our climate, if nothing else, <laughs> just, you know, just for the start. Yeah. And for me, I mean, other than humans are, what are we, 97% water. So, yeah, I, I feel a deep internal affiliation with water in my liquidity. Um, I'm, I'm also, I, I also think about, uh, I grew up in Northern Ireland, but my family had, was as immigrants. So I think my, my grandparents came from Lithuania and they went by boat to South Africa. And so there's that, I mean, across an ocean and ended up, you know, um, proximate to water. Then we moved to Ireland, which is an island. And then we traveled from Ireland across the ocean to this place where water freezes in this spectacular way, which I hadn't really ever seen to, to Ottawa again by a river. We lived right on a river. I mean, and now I, now I live in, in Hamilton for 30 years. So it's always about, I guess, in relationship to water um, and to specific um, 
yeah, specific bodies of water or, or water that, um, well, rivers and, and lakes and, and just be kind of locating ourselves in relationship to that as maybe as Lori said, that's human culture relates to water in a really basic way in terms of how we structure societies, but also how we, um, I think how we, how we relate to, um, is one, I mean, it's one of one of the important elements. So, as you know, we relate, relate to the ground, and the ground and water are connected in, you know, in different ways. And I think we're always aware of that. For, to me, I definitely have always had that kind of consciousness about water. Uh, and I'm interested in this uh, idea of when we talk about the watersheds, right? And um, thinking about a watershed as a kind of material reality, the ground on which we live, um, but also it's become this powerful metaphor uh, really in the last decade or so uh, for recognition of systems uh, of sustenance and dependence, right? Um, and that idea of realization to the watershed moment. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in uh, certainly the actual watersheds that we're talking about, but also the metaphors we use um, for consciousness and uh, an understanding in terms of that watershed moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got, a, a, <laughs> I've got a, a very ambitious idea for this episode of uh, Watershed Writers, in which, of course, we interrogate the idea of the watershed. And, uh, you know, I, I really want to know what the watershed moment of this watershed moment is <laughs> if we can be meta right like no pressure on you three or anything like that but I'm certainly thinking about that and so maybe I don't know what about uh, what about recognition and poetry's role in that when we talk about writing about water or water systems Um, I heard uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva speak on the weekend she's a uh, activist and food scholar, and she used she talked she was talking at a seed saving conference, and how she used seed is how I kind of want to use watershed in a way that she managed to put fit seed into everything she said, and I think we could think about watershed that way, like um, the metaphor of the watershed moment. There's I think the pandemic comes across as such a strong flag for a watershed moment when it comes not only to um, our health and our bodies and human health, but how interconnected we are. And, and water is one of those things that really connects us all. And, uh, and it can be a real metaphor for everything. And in the way that Dr. Shiva used the seed, and uh, those are my thoughts right now, I guess. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> what about the other two, Lori? Um, my, what comes to mind, the watershed moment that comes to mind right now is uh, one that I heard of uh, Elder Jen Sherman say uh, when I was at a, invited to, to speak in an event in Guelph just after my book Settler Education came out. And I have since heard lots of people say the same thing that I heard Jen say at this event. She was saying, this was in 20, beginning of 2017, the TRC report was, was not, I don't think even two years old at this point. And she was talking about reconciliation and what that might actually involve, what that might entail. And she said something to the effect of, in order to reconcile the way we want to reconcile and maybe she was talking to non-Indigenous people, perhaps more so. Uh, we have to first reconcile with the land, with the water and the air, if we want true, true reconciliation to happen. And so I, feel, I sense uh, when I go to readings that a lot of people are ready for, ready to start thinking about reconciliation and don't have the tools to do it and don't know what to do next. And it feels like reconciling with the land and the water and the air is the next, our next big task as, as settler people on this continent. What happens upstream affects downstream. So what happens in the world is going to filter down into the watershed, which I think is a is a metaphor. What we do, whether it's uh, down the line, down the stream in time, or physically, literally physically, we do some, we put something down the drain. We live a certain way on the land. It's going to filter 
into the water. It's going to, it's going to, you know, come, it's going to be uh, permeate through the land into the water systems. And from there, of course, it's all interconnected. So whatever else is connected to the water, like everything, um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be affected, I think. Um, and I also think in terms of metaphorically, um, I mean, it's a powerful water, obviously, is a is a core and, and kind of um, archetypical kind of image. But in terms of watershed, I mean, about kind of gathering together or maybe pooling and kind of wait, you know, because we are pooling resources, we're pooling consequences where, we're, you know, all of those kind of metaphorical things, I think, are um, are powerful. And maybe it's a very slow but very large wave, too, I think, you know, all of this. <laughs> And we're all in the same pool, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, never mind. Never mind the boat. We're actually in the in water, the, right? It's in the water. We're past the boat yeah. stage. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a great Indeed. word I read about um, in in my extensive Wikipedia research about watershed minutes before we began speaking. There was an amazing. Uh, I just love the word um, "impluvium" as for as a synonym for watershed, which is so great. Like this impluvium it means so it's raining. It, it, the in raining of the it, the it all gathers together. Just that kind of it makes it sound so dignified and you know. Never mind imperial. We're, we're in, it's the you know we're going to be impluviists, right or impluvial. Like impluvial. <laughs> wow! Wow. It, you know what? It, it sounds like the the title of a, of another anthology uh, that Yvonne has to edit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Impluvium. Um, okay. So speaking of the collection, I think I, Yvonne, I, I want to hear a little bit from you about um, uh, that uh, about getting the collection together about how uh, Caitlin Press, uh, who is the editor of Sweetwater, Poems for the Watershed, um, has supported you in, um, in the several collections that, that you have planned. Can you tell us a little bit about your dedication to water and water systems and um, how you came to Caitlin Press with this idea? Um, sure. So I think um, this all started when I was the City of Victoria's Poet Laureate, and I thought, oh, this is a title. I should do something kind of big with it. And I thought I would do something for the Pacific Ocean. And I really did think, you know, I really had this, I mean, I guess I give magical properties to poetry. Let's just put that there, <laughs> right? Because I really felt like just through a celebration of the Pacific Ocean and through an anthology and through communication and poetry through poetry, we could all start thinking more about the Pacific Ocean and protect it. That was my, <laughs> that was my thinking. And um, every poem I wrote over the four years as Poet Laureate mentioned water in some way. Um, so I just really focused in on that. And uh, I, I had decided to do an anthology and I thought I will start with Caitlin Press and Vicki Johnson said yes. <laughs> so that was just great. And then um, Refugium came out and at the launch, a couple of the poets were planning my future thinking, you know, Yvonne, maybe you should stay focused on water for a little longer. And so Vicki at Caitlin and I talked about what, what would it be like to do a trilogy of poetry based on water. And uh, we had earlier, Vicky had these ideas of the Arctic Ocean and how are we gonna pull the Arctic Ocean in? But um, I think the nice thing is, so the Pacific Ocean was the first one, watershed. So how we are all connected across the land through watersheds and then the Atlantic Ocean will be the third one. And um, yeah, I think it's been a huge learning experience. I live on the Pacific, so, and the Pacific is, huge and vast but contained whereas watersheds feel more octopus like right there they go everywhere we have 300 watersheds on southern vancouver island so it's not a very large area land wise but yet there's all this all these threads or rivers or streams of water so um, doing this book was a huge learning experience for me as well I'm really interested in thinking about those tributaries too, that often we think about um, uh, rivers uh, as being the, the main, um, the sort of main 
uh, artery of a, of a watershed, but many of us live around creeks and, and these other kinds of things, sometimes even hidden creeks that have been buried underneath uh, our city structures. Um, and that's fascinating to think about all those kinds of tendrils, right? I mean, you're talking about it being like an octopus, right? And uh, no, uh, no surprise that we have that aquatic creature and of course the, the structure of a, of a river. It's like the Fibonacci sequence, but not. Um, okay. <laughs> So let me ask here, um, we've got um, poets from uh, all across Canada writing about all kinds of watershed systems. And there's also an international reach as well. We've got uh, some Canadian poets writing about rivers in China, um, rivers um, in Russia. I think there's that, that one about um, Chernobyl. Um, and uh, did you imagine that this volume would have a kind of international reach as well as a national one? Yeah, I think I did because that happened with Refugium. So I had poets coming from Japan, uh, New Zealand, uh, Europe, and the US. And so because of that experience, I wanted the, to, the reach to be broad, I think. There's more Canadian poets in Sweetwater. Um, but um, the fact that the poets are hitting other water systems seems really important to me thinking about that interconnection. So if we're not connected through a watershed, we're connected through an ocean. And I just, yeah, and we're connected across time as well. And I think like Gary's story about his family travels made me think of my birth in, in Zimbabwe and then watching the water issues going on in Zimbabwe now. And we are for good or bad, I mean, it's all due to colonialism, but we are all very, very interconnected now and, and we are influencing not only each other, but also our water systems. And so I wanted to ask about this Herman Hess quotation that you have in Sweetwater. Yeah. And it is beautiful and I'll quote it now and, and then I'll ask you just a little bit about why you chose it and what you hope the people are getting from it. And uh, the quotation is, have you also learned that secret from the river, that there is no such thing as time? Yeah, so that quote opens the book. So um, I talk at the beginning of the book about what, what sweet water and what watershed is, and then the Hess quote. And it's from his book, Siddhartha. And in Siddhartha, um, he's thinking of the river as something beyond language and that is intuitive and has movement and life. And I think those are the kinds of things I wanted to, us to be thinking about or to enter the book with. Also, um, enlightenment, I guess, of the river and that if we, and of poetry, I guess, like that link between wisdom and water and our thinking, our thinking humans, which are the poets. And you also quote Langston Hughes, my soul has grown deep like rivers. Comment on Hughes? Yeah, so Hughes section is, Hughes quote is in the movement section, which I felt was appropriate because of all the places his poem, um, The Negro Speaks to Rivers, that poem travels to many places in the world as well. And so comes back to that thought of our interconnection not only through place, but over time. So he's bringing in, and also to want a book that wasn't just um, white settler poets. And so I worked quite hard to pull in other voices. Um, and Langston, whose voice is an important voice because of his experience and because where that poem goes and the movement within that poem. So. Great. Now, um, I asked you to read a little bit from, from Sweetwater, and uh, I put a little pressure on you for this first choice. I asked you to choose a poem um, from the collection, and remind me, how many uh, poets are collected here? 110. 110. That's a major undertaking. Um, so I asked you to do the impossible and to choose from those uh, 110 um, a poem that spoke to uh, a large idea of the watershed. And um, 
yeah, I was curious, of course, to see what you chose. And uh, yeah, can I, can I have you introduce what you're going to read and, and tell us why you've chosen it? Sure. So it's not an easy thing to choose a poem. I would hate for anyone to think I have favorites. <laughs> you know, the 110 poems in here. I mean, I, I know them all very intimately and um, have spent a lot of time with them. But I chose Ellie Kralji Gardner's poem, Exercise, partly because another huge thread that seemed to have emerged from collecting this book is a kind of feminist desire lines thread of women walking and women contemplating water. And Ellie's does that kind of very quite directly. And so this violence to earth is tied in for me to other violences, I guess. And it comes up a lot, like there's poems that use humor in here to talk about a little bit about how dumb we are that we use like old creosote buckets to contain our drinking water <laughs> or, you know, things like that, or a glass of water, how precious that is and how you, when you've traveled places where water or parts of Canada where you can't just drink the tap water, how precious water is and that glass on the table in a restaurant, what a accomplishment or a gift it is to have it. But anyway, I chose exercise, so I will read it. Exercise. Deep in the cedars, I bring ocean out onto my skin. Splatters from the crown let everything wet, puddling in the crotch of trees. Saturated nurse logs spruce up with plump pads of moss. The buds bleeding pop music slide out of my ears while mist settles amidst root systems. On the trail, I do not smile at men. Women have dogs. We hay each other, but the men know. They run importantly, tight elbowed in new balance and shorts, flaunting core, heat despite dipping degrees. They hate waiting. I do not owe them anything. The radio in the car states a killer has been charged with violating a 13-year-old girl's body and throwing it in the bushes of a park. I don't owe men anything. I pour rainwater out of my backpack. The skies of Russia pool in the footwell. On the bridge across the inlet, truck spray grays my vision. I drive blind, tires reading in braille. My thighs are plastered cold and my neck slews its dried grit, the pinched dish of Himalayan salt he keeps by the stove. Bark filing sneak through my socks. Bath water raises my blood, particulates of Baden-Powell's colonialism to the surface. My salt sighs. I slide soap down my stomach as chainsaws eat the trees next door, choking the air with splinters. And for those who don't have the poem in front of them, I do, because there's the volume. Um, but I note that uh, the title of the poem is Exercise, and she's punning on the idea of exorcism, right? To get rid of something, um, to get rid of something violently, and of course, to, um, to exercise, as in to exercise one's rights or one's body. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, um, a lot in there. And um, yeah, I think all of that comes back to an, you know, another kind of watershed moment. We're think, talk, thinking about political and cultural watersheds as well, right? Great, thank you. And I've, I've also asked you to offer a little something of uh, your own as well. Um, you were very generous as an editor and didn't include a poem of your own in, uh, in Sweetwater, but I do want you to, to read a little something of your own as well. The poem I'm going to read is called Weather, and it touches on fires that have happened on the West Coast or the smoke that has hit Vancouver Island from these fires. Weather. Sometimes swimming, you are also immersed in fire. Ash coats your wet hair and the sun has been stolen, replaced by an orange ball shaken to glow. Ash in your lungs as you dive and a tree falls. We'll be safe here, your nephew calls as he jumps in. How fast are you aging? Ash fills the lines on your face like stage makeup. The dog can no longer see her feet through water, so will not come out to you. Yelps from the rocky edge. Yodels for you to get out or because she wants to get in. 
Heat escalates, smoke in your skin, in the boy's hair. Clouds are not clouds, air a barrier you dive through to water. You will drive south, rub soot into your now dry skin, lick your lips pink again. Through the fast window, trees now husks tarnish what light is left, the incandescent shoots of spring. Great, Yvonne, thank you very much. Uh, certainly for all the, the work you've done uh, for Water and Water Systems as your position uh, as Poet Laureate of uh, City of Victoria, which uh, ended uh, in what year, remind me? Uh, 2018. Okay, and 2018, and I know it's hard to remember, right? No, no, no. And, <laughs> and, uh, and of course your ongoing uh, work with uh, the, the anthologies for the water. Okay, we're going to move to um, Southwestern Ontario now that we've had this kind of national and global look at what the um, anthology Sweetwater does. And um, I'm gonna ask Laurie Graham to talk a little bit about our, her contribution to the book, um, working with uh, the Thames watershed or um, the Antler River as it, it appears in her poem. I had to look this up because I thought, what, where does the Thames River flow? And so if you're thinking of the kind of political work that the anthology can do, this is at least part of it to have people go, where does that water go? Who drinks it? Where does it end up? So I researched, it flows southwesterly from a source near Tavistock through London, several other towns, including Chippewa and Oneida, uh, Oneida First Nations community. And it drains into Lake St. Clair, which I didn't know this because I didn't grow up in Ontario, is known as the sixth great lake between Ontario and Michigan. So Laurie, you are up. Um, do you want to read from uh, Antler River and, and talk a little bit about um, how and why you wrote it. And uh, before I start to, I should say this, uh, the forks of, of the Thames of Deshkan Zibi is where London, Ontario was kind of built around. It's a very significant spot to that city and, and a significant spot in that river, Antler River. Pigeon waltzing the trail on one foot and one little nub. Mallards and their escaped domestic kin and the bright rasping horns of Canada deep Canada geese in false spring in glacier turquoise water. Hundreds and hundreds of sharps sinking into the banks. Nests of clothes, tents, tarps. Broken trees help down the banks with chainsaws. Water rainbow slicked, the salt spackled ground, the farmed transplants, the white breadcrumbs. Up the bank, courthouse, hockey arena, brutalist government tower, city museum, wind. Down here, the fork in the river, the sacred. Now, you and I met, we actually met because of poetry and river activism. Uh, because you ordered, uh, you organized, pardon me, a uh, Poets for the Peace reading for the Peace River and a fundraiser in December 2016 in Kitchener. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's how we, we got to make our acquaintance. That makes me think um, a little bit about uh, your work uh, with reading the local and thinking about, um, I think about your work on reading the local and reading it as intensely layered and historical as well as being vitally present. And can you talk a bit about how you came to that way of working and what it means in your work? And I, I know that you are um, very close to finishing a collection that, um, that is rooted actually in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo in this kind of environment and uh, in the water that moves here. Can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about how, what you've been doing in that collection and maybe read us a piece from it? I'm acutely aware in this collection of just how much water there is, just what a watery place uh, this, this greater Southern Ontario area is. And living as with the Great Lakes as a neighbor, it's, it's something that you have to um, 
really kind of uh, you have to figure out your relationship to to water here in in one way or another. It'll it'll come into your basement. It'll it'll, <laughs> it'll it exists right right close to you. Uh, the collection is right now titled "The Larger Forgetting." I don't know if that's if it's going to land there or not. You'd mentioned that I do tend to to. Uh, there's a pretty deep water table to my poems. I, I found, I don't know why I do this, but I do find that I, I'm most comfortable with standing in a place and then expressing in some way it's the widest view of its, of its presence and of its history as possible. That feels to me like uh, that's where poetry lives for me. That is all I can really say about it. So, um, yeah, I'm going to just read one, one poem, uh, well, one page from this. It's a book length poem uh, that, that weaves in all manner of directions. But this, this page that I'll read from uh, tentatively titled Larger Forgetting uh, follows Schneider Creek in Kitchener, which was the creek that was closest to where I lived when I lived in Kitchener. Broken limbs on nearly all the trees along the rail path. Branches encased in ice one winter and snapped at the sockets. The rail line ripped out and sodded over, then a patch of sod pulled back to show a few remaining ties and a plaque erected. The creek jangling along corrugated iron banks, storm drains delivering salt and plastic with the melt and the rain. Grass pushed through any fissure, weeping willow trying to graze the surface of the rusty water, sheared by the hard creek bottom. The concrete gets tagged and grayed over and tagged, rough sketches of the contours of hills, the tamped sand, the road crush, the creek finding its course below ground. The concrete takes on the striations of rock, ored, dark, shale threaded, alkali. Groundwater corroding the rusted banks white. An upturned paper plate a sealed Tupperware with a sandwich in it. Trees spilling over the embankment. Fat splat of drainage. Dogging around feces to check on the state of the creek before impending storm. A young willow pushed up through a fissure. A man too old to be carrying all that steel through the fabrication yard above. The drainage seems to scale and incline before reaching the creek's concrete floor, its concrete channel. Field of dead waving goldenrod in an empty factory's parking lot. The curled tongues of failed sod, the sickness of soil along the road. Fresh sidewalks and the way the road crew stares down at me like cattle, concerned, vacant, mawing. I realize looking at my own work and, and preparing to talk to you today, just how pervasive it is, just how essential to, to all life it ends up being and, it, and how in, intrinsic to, to my poems it is. And it's also a, a, a relates in some ways to, to uh, trying to engender justice in some way in, in the poem as well, to give time to the things that are crucial to, to all life. Uh, so I, I don't, that's about as, as clear as I've been able to make it for myself, just in terms of why water appears in my work and, and how it does. This is our opportunity to look at um, watersheds across uh, southwestern Ontario. And we talked uh, about the Thames watershed. We've talked about the Grand River watershed uh, a little bit. And now um, I'm going to ask Gary Barwin to talk a little bit about his work uh, writing the Chidoke watershed Hamilton uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, from the Niagara Escarpment into Lake Ontario at Coots Paradise Marsh. Um, Gary, I know you spent a lot of time in Coots Paradise, and in your last book, uh, No TV for Woodpeckers, you have a whole um, series called, a whole section called Needleminder, and uh, a section of that came, uh, also appeared in Sweetwater. Hmm. So uh, I want to invite you now to talk a little bit about the context of the Needleminder series and what got included in, uh, in Sweetwater. 
first of all, one thing that's really apparent, I mean, Hamilton is, is a city of, of, of water. I mean, and Hamilton, and then before that, Dundas, it, it was the reason it was on the very end of Lake Ontario, um, the very westernmost part. And as far in as you could get, you get into Cook's Paradise, and then you go, like, that's the reason historically the city started here. But even before that, the reason there's an escarpment is because of water that, you know, you know various glaciational patterns and, and um, uh, prehistorical, uh, a prehistorical lake. And so the land collapsed. And then so Hamilton is filled with ravines and creeks as a result of the geography. And so you can't go, um, you can't throw a Tim Hortons donut without hitting a creek in, in Hamilton, basically. And then I started um, just at the end of the street um, there's this place, Goods Paradise, which is, there's Burlington, there's Lake Ontario, then there's Burlington Bay, and then leading off Burlington Bay, there's this marshland, which has been undergoing a process of change. And one thing I started kayak, my wife got me a kayak for my 50th birthday. So I would start kayaking just down at the end of my street. And it occurred to me, I was kind of shocked to we don't think we live in historical time. And I was aware of when I first came to Hamilton 30 years ago, things were different and I could see the creek, I see the Coots Paradise was different. They've been really working on making it back to be a marsh, making it not polluted, getting rid of invasive species. And, and I was kayaking one day and there was some kind of mammal that I didn't recognize. I had no idea what it was. It's like, what? There's a what? How, how, how can I not know a mammal? Like birds, I know there's millions of kinds of birds and I don't know, I, you know. Um, other than geese, they're all, I don't, I don't know, you know, but, but like mammals. And so, it, and so that really struck me. And I started thinking about what creatures used to be there, what were invasive and what now we're coming back, um, ha having, because of reclaiming the, the watershed, I mean, reclaiming coots and fixing the watershed around it too. And then I also found out that Hamilton, though it's famous for being this, you know, ugly, dirty city, not only is it really beautiful, but that, it's unique in that because it's on the very end of Lake Ontario, migrating species, it's off, there's a remarkable number of species that can be found um, here because rather than crossing the lake, the closest place they can land is the very end of the lake and then they continue migrating. So Hamilton is, and, and Coots is, is one of the places for that. So it's really remarkable. So basically I wrote a series of poems having been amazed at the number of species that were here and that are now introduced that I took previously existing poems by other poets, and I kind of re-populated re, uh, them with species names that can be found in, in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, so it's just the way that we have taken away, we've been able to repopulate Coots Paradise in Hamilton from, with, uh, with these species. Um, so the, I'm, I'm, making, I'm nesting them in, in other poems and allowing them to have their own little poetic ecosystems within within that. Oh. So that's that's where those poems came from. So the birds of Hamilton, Ontario. We are for the Chuck Will's widow, the horned grebe, the fulvous whistling duck, for looking directly into the semi-palmated plover, for the shearwater, for the lazuli bunting, the razorbill and the canvasback redhead, for the ferruginous hawk and the black crowned night heron, for black legged kittiwakes in general for cerulean warblers specifically, for recalling the bohemian waxwing and the black rail, for the veery and the little blue heron, for the belted kingfisher and the least bittern, for the American redstart and Wilson's phalarope, for the black necked stilt, the long-billed curlew, the, great, the greater yellow legs, the muddy godwit, for the turnstone red knot and the pectoral sandpiper, for the storm petrel, the glossy ibis, for the great cormorant, for living in madness. I guess it's amazing in this industrial city that I never thought really thought about, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species. It's yeah. astounding and as there is everywhere, right? Yep. And they live in some interesting inter, inter, inter relation with us. Great. Um, should uh, I read another one of these? Uh, sure, read another one of those. And then I know you, you've got another one about specifically about Coots Paradise that you've written after, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so I'll read, the, I'll read the shorter one then. The snakes of Hamilton, Ontario. Ring-necked the puppy, that's ring-necked the milk snake is mud puppy, red belly, oh, what the garter, red-backed, four-toed, blue-spotted, ribbon, smooth, green. Oh, what the ring-necked milk snake, all red belly garter, oh, ribboned mud puppy, oh, four-toed, blue-spotted, never ribboned, oh, all smooth, green, oh. Well, see, I don't know if I'll read all of it, but I'll read um, some of it. So it's um, Commencement for Coots Paradise. 
Um, okay, I'll just, I'll just read it. Commencement for Coot's Paradise. Fish hovering above silt, their mouths open, hoovering the almost dark. 10,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. If humans are 60% water, heart 73%, lungs 83%, how many humans is that? Very colored humans reaching forward, displacing the river, swimming, floating in liquid sky. Someone left a valve open. They told us in science class, love plus time equals death. No, that was my grade nine girlfriend. Our world is sensation and memory. Our 73% brains are 31% bones. Stellar nucleosynthesis resulting in the complex organic molecules necessary for life formed in the protoplanetary disk of dust grains surrounded the sun before the formation of the earth plus energy equals city councillors. 24 billion gallons of sewage is what is going on inside of us, while 24 billion gallons of sewage is what we do on the outside, or according to David, according to David Kessler, grief. Old David Foster Wallace Fish, morning boys, how's the water? Young DFW uh, Fish, what the hell is water? The moon fills bedrooms, kitchens, basements with its silver, staircases slick with shine. 24 billion gallons of fish slide into our homes, our 73% brain a stippled perch spawning at night. Here's the heart pumping under its sheath of shad. Here's a largemouth bass slithering upstream toward heart chambers. A thousand vena cava tributaries, the watershed of our fist-sized swims. A valve releases fish and eels, frogs and water, voles into our chest, our forever mudrooms and rec rooms. Here, fish plus eels plus frogs plus voles equal 24 billion gallons of sewage and runoff. A mouth, a kind of valve, open, large mouth, duck-faced, to the dark everywhere. Here, our bre bre breathing strain through the weir of our teeth. How many breaths fill an Olympic pool? No, we breathe air. It's the gills of our grade nine girlfriend where water fins. City councillors stock pockets with frogs, fish, eels, water voles, lift glasses from their civic desks, tip lake water in, a sidereal bi biome, removable, a hand's worth of pond or river. Shh, the susurration of rippling. Shh, the secrets held in a closed mouth, a net, a Celtic knot of fish. What the hell water, where fish glug and burble, tell it truth light, slanted towards silt. What is river, is lake, is marsh, is time plus death equals love. My grade nine girlfriend and me on the shore of Coot's paradise, human as driftwood, twig-sized toes sunk and wet in the near shore sandy muck, blood circulating under our high school skin as if across the upper city, combed by waterfalls, raked over escarpment cliffs, runneling down rivers into a lake where our feet stand in the cool and hands in each other's hands. We open our mouths to the dark, breathe stickleback, tadpole mad tom, green sunfish, fine-scaled dace, northern hog-nosed hog sucker. How much dark is in a river? lake or marsh, how much light, watershed of night, of day, those with veins, those without. No, it wasn't my grade nine girlfriend. It wasn't me. We, were, we weren't looking at 24 billion gallons, its dark surface, 100 billion pounds of starlight gone, a nearly 100% full moon. What plus what equals this? What plus what is here to breathe the silt of this dark night? Wow. Oh, I, I love that. How much dark is in a river? <laughs> My gosh, we'll be thinking about that for a long time. Um, oh, just great. Uh, you know, I know Sweetwater had a number of um, uh, very lively launches for, for the collection. I remember there was definitely uh, one where there was some, some epic chat going on in the, uh, the side chat and uh, people were cheering on these poems, which was wonderful to see. I want to hear from all three of you about this idea um, about a, a quote that uh, appears in Sweetwater. It's on page 141, if you are following along at home, and it's from William Stafford, and it is. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me about the mistakes I have made. Can any of you riff on that in terms of what poetry does, um, what, uh, what water does, and just everything we've been talking about, the watershed consciousness? I invite you comment the first thing <laughs> that comes to my mind hearing that quote is that when the river is iced when it's winter time that is that is the season for reflection that's what poetry does well uh so that that might be in some way related there but i i also think of um 
of, for some reason, of Robert Bringhurst and what something he wrote in Learning to Die, a book he wrote with Jen Zwicky about thinking like an ecosystem, learning to think like an ecosystem and learning to think in a, a larger, more complex way, perhaps, or to, to, to put yourself in the, in the mindset of the world. Uh, and so I was thinking about, as, as you were reading that quote about putting yourself in the mindset of ice. Um, it makes me think of the Yukon River for some reason. I don't know why that is. I think I sat out with Clea Roberts one night when I was up there on the top of her car. I always wanted to see Aurora Borealis, but never did. But while we sat there, we could hear the river breaking up. And there, there is something so evocative about that as well. So the reflective ice and the, that the ice will vanish, that the ice will break is interesting. And I think, is Stafford thinking about the Hess quote? There's some kind of link there too that I looked, I noticed yesterday when thinking about this, that um, to the grief, there's grief in there, I guess. And I guess for me, um, the pull of doing these anthologies is, is trying to trying to create something to speak to that grief and that ask me is the question of what can humans do now that will make things less bad I guess. Quote about the book must be the axe that breaks the frozen river you know and it's like so what's one of the things that poetry can 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 do I mean it seeps it doesn't change things it sort of seeps into the world and around it gets into the language and it keeps us, you know, but I also think that things are freeze that they melt. And so those things that even if we haven't dealt with them, we will have to deal with them when they defrost, like mm. the consequences of our culture. And I, I also think in our language, right? The things that are forgotten, the things that we don't uh, in the language melt, you know, melt and uh, they're, they come back, we, we are responsible for them. It's, they're in the genetic, in the DNA. Once they're in the, you know, the water that's, DNA stream, that, you know, like mutant salmon, they're always there. And so it's part of our job as writers to, you know, fight the good fight by keeping, keeping language vital and making sure it's attending to the things it needs to attend to and listening and recording and noticing and um, speaking to those important things, because it, it, it doesn't just stay where it is, it seeps in ways that we don't realize. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's a, a, a great thing to think about as we uh, as we sign off on this episode today, uh, how things are seeping into us, all right, and how we need to tend to the things that need to be tended to. I want to thank the three of you, uh, contributors and editors, uh, editor of Sweetwater Poems for the Watersheds, in which so much of Southern Ontario is, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, also a national and international collection. So thank you, Yvonne Blomer, Laurie D. Graham, and Gary Barwin. Uh, thanks very much for having me and for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tanis, and thank you all of you for your poems. Thank you, Tanis, for inviting me, and thank you, Yvonne, for this anthology. Mm -hmm.